Okay, good evening everybody. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We're in for a special live stream and now everybody, I am very proud to be introducing a special guest, none other than that, than my mother Naomi. So mum, welcome to the live stream. We're very proud to have you as the guest and we had been talking about it a few short days about, ago about uh, doing a live together especially since the uh, the Mother's Day post I did just over a few short months ago. So, you ready, Mum? Say your piece. I'm ready. Well, what do you want me to say? Well, because well, you had an interesting childhood, you were brought up as a Jehovah's Witness, and, uh, oh, someone saying, thank you, Joy. Joy saying you look beautiful. Oh, thanks, Joy. Thank you. That's really kind of you. And Zef, she said, uh, you're beautiful too. Oh, thanks, Zef. Trevor Colt, he's in the house. Trevor Colt, MC, the war veteran. Oh, he's hi, saying, Jeff. He's saying hello to you. Hi. All these names are really familiar. I've, I've, I've heard all about all of you. And Caroline Allen from Canada, she's saying hello. Hi, Caroline. And uh, we've got... Uh, We've got Graham and Fiona from Gibraltar, the two Brits who live in Gibraltar. Hello to them. Hey, Graham and Fiona, hi. Yes, you already know from you. Yeah, Marcia, do you remember Marcia from the live? Hi, Marcia. Okay. Now, time to showcase um, the story in Captivated Depth. Now, you grew up, brought up as a Jehovah's Witness. Yes. And obviously, you're... Your experiences are so vivid, as you were saying to me and my brother many, many times in our childhood. Could you please um, tell everybody what it was like being brought up as a Jehovah's Witness? What it was like being a young child, all childhood as Jehovah's Witness, right from yeah. birth? Yeah, it was awful. <laughs> it was a, you know, pretty awful experience. I remember being probably about five and sitting in the meetings that we had to go to and excuse, I know I told you off for of swearing Ben but um Foxy sorry um and I told you off for of swearing before but I remember thinking this is complete bullshit in the meetings because it I, I just remember thinking that this doesn't make any sense um I'd say probably the one good thing about it was that I learned to read really early um, but other than that I wouldn't say there was anything positive that came from it. Yeah, but it's good there's a good positive it helped you learn to read because always that's very important in the early developmental stages of childhood reading writing arithmetic that sort of thing and mm -hmm. there's one really restricted thing about being a Jehovah's Witness is that one's seldom allowed to be uh, friends with people who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. So could you explain what that was like in childhood? Yeah, it was really difficult. So I would obviously have friends at school and I'd make really good friends with people at school, but I wasn't really allowed to see them outside of school. I could only really associate with other Jehovah's Witnesses, um, which was difficult because um, I might not like them. You know, I didn't really have any close bonds with them. So, um, so yeah, so it's really hard not being able to just go around my friends' houses or have them at my house. It was really difficult. Yeah, no, I could imagine. I mean, it's a good thing because you left the religion at the age of 17. But could you explain for those of you who have, you know, who may not be familiar with the whole process of Jehovah's Witnesses, could you explain to them how you tender your res res resignation from the re religion itself? Well, it very much depends on where you are in the religion so there's various stages you can you get baptized at usually people tend to get baptized around 13 14 is the sort of common age it's a decision that you make yourself you're not baptized at birth um i right. never got baptized because i didn't believe in it so um so i just left i just stopped going i left home because i couldn't That's see how i would leave unless i left home um, and I just stopped going to the to the meetings, so that's how I left. But oh, if I was an... baptized, it would have been a much more complicated process. You have to get oh. disfellowshipped, which is a whole thing. Okay, so that's a very interesting way to put it. So you were never really baptized. I'm pretty sure because if you're if you're Jewish, you're bar mitzvahed at the age of thirteen, but it's not the same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses. No, you know. But so obviously, you grew up 
all childhood up until the age of 17 from birth Jehovah's Witnesses mm -hmm. and growing up with you know not allowed to go around your friend's house after school only socialize with friends mm -hmm inside of school but not outside i mean that is a very very tough restrictive childhood to have you know and there's another oh, thing that sorry, i was about oh. to say probably the worst part of it was having to do the what they call the field service which is when you go knocking on the doors which jehovah's witnesses are famous for and that everybody laughs about them for is that you know they're knocking on the door and everyone hides behind their sofa um, yeah. imagine being a child who doesn't want to do that being forced to do that on a saturday and sunday oh yeah and there have been occasions where i've knocked on the door of my teacher or a friend from school and it is absolutely mortifying oh i could but i could imagine you know trevor was just saying interesting how religion is very much brainwashing of its followers yes i mean you'd say something like that on trevor's um showcase point with religion wouldn't you say given yeah. what trevor had to share yeah, Trevor, you're 100% right. I think a lot of people are brainwashed by it, um, including some of my own family. I mean, none of my siblings have remained in it. They're, I'm the youngest of seven, so there's a lot of us. Yeah. But, um, but um, I, I have certainly seen brainwashing, and they use brainwashing tactics as well. And um, when you really analyse the way they go about things, it's, it is a type of brainwashing. It's almost like Hitler in the Nazi Germany, where they brainwashed the Hitler youth to like really being firmly loyal to Hitler. Almost like that, but just different in the way one could say it. Absolutely. Now we've got Hutch in the house. Hutch and Mel, he's saying, how is your mother so young? She's saying, you look like my sister. Well, I'll tell you something, Hutch. <laughs> There's 23 years between us. I was born a few short days after my mother's... Uh, 23rd birthday so my mother will be 46 years young but you are right she does look very young not just her but all of my mother's siblings because as she said she's youngest of seven all seven who are now well over the age of 50 they probably don't look 40 they look younger than 40 i would say that thanks hurts you're my new best friend <laughs> <laughs> yeah he could be the white uncle mark to some extent because he's bald and glasses but he's a bit shorter Okay. And he's not the muscle like Hutch, uh, not like oh. Uncle Mark, you know. Yeah. Okay, Susan's asking you a good question. Did it affect your relationship with your parents? Now, did being a Jehovah's Witness affect your relationship with your parents? I Yeah, it's a really good question, Susan. I think, yes, because I suppose you saw, I mean, I very much love my mum. She is still a Jehovah's Witness. She's 80, is she 85, Ben? Um, 85. Oh, sorry. 85. Um, 85, yeah just 85 um, now yeah, yeah so she's 85 so she's you know she's elderly she's been a Jehovah's Witness since she was 16 um and it's very much 18 when she became Jehovah's Witness no I think she was 16 I think 16 I think it was about 1957 she became a Jehovah's Witness so she would have been about 18 okay yeah maybe you're right there um and I think it did because when you question it yourself you wonder why they are so devout um, so that was um, challenging. And, and my father, who passed away when Foxy was just born. Um, I was four and a half months. Yeah. Um, he was um, quite high up in, in the religion. So um, it does affect your relationship, I think. Yeah. This is a very big point. Uh, we just had Wanda saying that my mother is very young looking and a beautiful soul. Oh, Wanda, thank you so much. Maureen, Maureen, you make a serious point. Religion should be comfort and not a fear for us. What, what do you say to Maureen's words? Absolutely. And I think one of the big tactics of the religion was fear. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen any of the literature that they produce. Um, a lot, Lots of the illustrations, is, it's all about what's going to happen at Armageddon and how... Uh, the world's going to be destroyed and it's it's all very emotive um illustrations and um there's a lot of fear behind it so yeah you're spot on there and uh, mary was uh, echoing uh maureen sentiment oh poor mary and glenn they're going through a lot right now first they had glenn's ear aching issues and now they just lost their cat so condolences oh, no. to mary and glenn following the loss of their missy nutmeg the cat who just died recently I'm so sorry to hear that. That's heartbreaking. I'm sure you've all seen our cats on. Definitely, Nipsey. 
yeah actually yeah. i've just got them next to me now <laughs> and um it's yeah i'm really sorry that is absolutely heartbreaking it is it's you know they're like part of the family so but this is true this is a similar sentiment Dave and Sally Abel would say. Any pets, cats, dogs, anyone, they're not just an animal, they're part of the family. So our condolences, mine and my mother's condolences and everybody's condolences to you, Mary and Glenn, if I may so share. Thank you, Ria. She's asking to hit the like. Very well said. Thank you, Ria. That's very nice. She said what, sorry? Ria just reminding of everybody to hit the like and hit hit the like as it goes oh, nice losing an animal is a tough one yes i completely agree well as i said christy they're not just animals they're part of the family mm. yes and also there's a very interesting thing we were going to talk about in this topic was mm. that you astonishingly most people a lot of even i did tell graham that i'm a mixed he found this very hard to believe you yourself are half Jamaican. So could you please tell um, everybody what it's like having half Jamaican heritage? Because our, my late grandfather, your father, was Jamaican. So would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I suppose obviously it's all I've known. Um, but yeah, so my father was actually part of the Windrush generation. He came over to England in 1959. So um a long time ago if he was still alive how old would he be foxy if he was still alive he'd be in his 90s he'd be, he'd be 93 because he his birthday was april yeah yeah so um i would say it was quite tough in my childhood because i grew up in the 80s and it wasn't just the 80s but it was also the 80s in southeast kent which wasn't exactly a very diverse part of the country um so i'd say we were pretty much the only mixed race family there i think there may have been one other family um it was a very racist time really oh yeah certainly down where i was from which was sort of near margate in kent oh. and um so it was difficult i think it was harder for my brothers they used to get into lots of fights um it didn't really happen i, I went to a really good school so i didn't really experience any sort of overt racism that's um, good but it, things were things were different um you know, that I remember once when I was at university, um, looking around a little boutique shop and being followed around by the um, uh, by the shopkeeper because they just assume um, that you're going to steal something. Or um, yeah, but I but I think where we live is a very open and um, a, a, a part of the country that is sort of really open to difference. So. I would say living here, I don't really experience any problems, but certainly where I grew up, it was it was challenging at times. No, I mean, racism, especially whether you're black or half black mixed, it's, it's a very serious issue. Certainly still, as of now, you'd think it'd be gotten to grips with by this point in this day and age, but obviously it's not 100% gotten to grips with, which is as truth as things. But think of all the racism Grandad Eric would have gone through back in what nineteen fifty nine and throughout the sixties, oh, and think of, and just how difficult it would have been. It's certainly most dysfunctional and all that, and think of just how difficult it would have been for him and my grandmother or Nanny Margaret to have gotten married. You know, a white woman and a black woman getting married in what June of nineteen sixty six. My dad was a black man, Ben, and um, not a black, black woman. Man. <laughs> black man and a white woman. <laughs> you you called him a black woman. <laughs> oh shit! Oh, excuse the language, but my. Okay, Hutch is asking you a question. Do you embrace the Jamaican lifestyle, the food, music, etc.? Well, Hutch, my mother is a uh, vegan. She's got certain dietary needs, but uh, in terms of the music, what's your take on that? In Hutch's question. Yeah. So. I certainly like music of black origin. I'm very much into R&B um, mm -hmm. music. Um, as far as Jamaican music, not really. And that's not for any reason other than I wasn't really exposed to it. So my father, I don't know whether it was because of his religion or just his personality, he didn't really introduce his culture to us, um, either food or music. But I can certainly appreciate it, but I wouldn't say it's, it was a huge part of my life, which I think yeah. is really um but last summer we met up with do you, do you remember foxy we went and met up with loads of jamaican relatives in london 
it's some of which we had never met and and we ate loads of Jamaican food and um it was it was a really amazing experience so it's something that I would love to be in touch with more but but the reality of my life is that I grew up in UK very much influenced by my English mother um didn't get yeah. many cultural influences from my father so um so it's something I need to explore more yeah yeah no, that's, that's an interesting thing that's an interesting way to put it you know just to say uh trevor he's got a question now your perspective and trevor's question he's he's asking you do you feel racism is still rife or do you feel it's fading in one way or another i would say it is still rife i think um not necessarily where we are in brighton not to our faces anyway um but What's interesting is that Foxy obviously looks pretty European. Most people don't realise he has any kind of black heritage in him at all. But then my other son, who is only a year younger than Foxy, looks Rex, more... he's 15 months younger, yeah. Yeah, so he looks more mixed race. And um, the way they are treated is very different. So, for example, Rex will be walking down the street and have old ladies cross the road because they feel that he's going to do something um whereas i don't think you probably ever had that foxy because no assume that you are european so um many so people I, assume i'm italian or french but yes get to the next point yeah so i think that it is still right i think that was really evident i think there's periods of time when that's really evident so for example anyone that's into football when it was the euros the last euros when the three young black footballers missed the penalties. Some of the comments in the newspapers or online about them um, were all focused on their race and were really vile. Um, and it's it's moments like that when you're like, actually, yeah, we're, we're, we're not progressing as a society when it comes to race. Just, just really sad. Um, so yeah, I think it is still right. I think living in Brighton and Hove or in a a really unique situation where um people are very accepting so it's i don't experience it on a day-to-day -day basis but i think nationwide it is still rife yeah trevor's just answered uh, just given an answer to your very answer his partner gwen yes this is right she's filipino so he understands your point very clearly yeah yeah sorry to hear that that you know that you've experienced difficulties as well but yeah, it's it's definitely a problem. Yeah, you know, and uh, so yes, I mean, it's 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 just so just it it shocks me greatly, you know, in a way that uh, many people have not too much trouble about white people, but there's always um, a lot of um, attention turned towards black people because they think they've got bad intentions. I mean, you know. You'd think in this day and age it's really gotten to grips with, but it hasn't. It's just an appalling, if one way one way should put it, and all that. Yeah, but racism is a really interesting thing, Foxy, because it's not just white against black. It can also be black against white. It can also yeah, be no, exactly. Black. I don't go against the point. Yeah, it could also be within the black cultures. You get racism between African blacks and West Indian blacks within different African countries. You get racism between. Asian and black, you know, so it's oh, really yeah. complex. Um, but um, and I've certainly experienced, like as a mixed race person, I think you've got a unique perspective because um, you don't really fit into white culture or black culture, so you sort of experience it from both sides. Yeah. And earlier on, we had Graham saying that uh, he he would like to visit Jamaica. Well. You've had the experience of being going to Jamaica several times. So would you advise for or would you advise against going to Jamaica? So I've actually only been once, Foxy. I went once when I was 16. Um, and That's right, yeah. It, yeah, it's an incredibly beautiful country. And I'm sure we've all seen the pictures of the beaches and how beautiful... The palm trees. It. Yeah, exactly. But it is... I actually found the experience quite terrifying. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty violent country. You have to be very careful. I would say if you go, stay in a resort, um, which is secure. Um, I wouldn't go wandering around the streets of Jamaica. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll get a lot of comments about that. But 
personally, I think you have to be very careful in a country like that if, if you're not in a resort. Yeah. Sorry, I accidentally highlighted a comment Mary said. Yes, we're sort of the same. We don't pay attention to outside. We look inside what the person's core depth of personality is like. Oh, and that's, all that. that's the best way forward. Absolutely. That's what it's all about, for sure. Yeah. OK, we've got John Griffin. He was the one who thought you looked beautiful. Oh, thanks, John. Yes, uh, I was telling you about John, didn't I, John Griffin? I think he's British and he's the one who's well into his 70s. Well, he's uh -huh. 77. Amazing. I think he's either 77 or going on for 78 this year, just to say. Okay, yes. And Susan earlier on said she'd been 10 times and she loved it. Okay. Did you stay in a resort though, Susan? Yes, yes, Susan, did you stay in a resort? That's the vital question. You know, so that's a very interesting story, you know, having been to Jamaica once, because you've been outside of the European continent, you've experienced several different experiences um, because of being a, mix, a half Jamaican mixed, uh, mixed race, and obviously brought up all childhood Jehovah's Witness and all that, you know. So uh, that's always, that's a very, very interesting story, you know, and uh, and that you never experienced racism, luckily enough. But uh, but to get to another side, my uncles, my three uncles, your three older brothers, I mean, they experienced fights. So could you talk to everybody about what it was like and whether, you know, if they sustained any injuries or bruises and all that? Did they ever sustain injuries getting into fights and things I'm sure because of who they were? Yeah, I'm sure. They, I mean, I was always because I'm so much younger than them that I, I don't really know. But um, I don't think anyone necessarily had a broken bone or anything. But I think oh, there was a lot of issues. They had obviously they had white friends. They still do have white friends. Oh, um, yes. Um, but um, but I think there were there was an element of, you know, racism that would end up in fights for them. But I don't know too much about it. No, but they I, would have kept private about it. Like to ask you, Foxy. Um, how was it for you growing up in a mixed race family? It's probably no different to a white family. I've never experienced racism. And the only time I've ever experienced racism was being called the N word once at secondary school. And mm -hmm. I don't even, and I'm actually, even though I'm a mixed race individual, many wouldn't believe this. No. Well, it's, it's it's quite bizarre calling you the M-word when you just look like a, a white A European. But yeah, but they were clearly calling you that because they've seen me. Because, you know? yes, because you're half Jamaican. Yeah. Yes. Mm. You know, and, uh, oh, Osborne, who's on here, he says, I have my mother's eyes. Yes, both me, myself and my brother, we have my mother's eyes. Aww. Just to say. We've got Fiona in here. Fiona is saying you're beautiful and fascinating and she believes you've had an interesting life. Yes, I oh, think she has had an interesting life. Thank you. That's a really lovely thing to say. Thank you. Uh, we've got Moogs in here. Hi, Moogs. She's just saying that uh, you're looking beautiful. Oh, Moogs, thank you. I wish I could see all of you because I'm sure you're all really beautiful too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, Mary's saying a nice compliment uh, about you. What's she say? She's saying, I can tell you're a wonderful mum. And she's saying that I'm a fabulous young gent. Oh, he is a fabulous young gent. And I've done my best. I was very young when I had him, but I've done my 23, best. 23, yeah. And Trevor is saying, you've done a wonderful job raising me. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. That means a lot. I'm very proud of him. Thank you. Yes, and I do know this very explicitly clearly. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, and one thing I did want to to say, once you, the next part we want to get to is, uh, is when you moved out at the age of 17, because you moved in with who still very much alive as, alive as of these day, as of 2024, but obviously not in the greatest of health, but okay, but not particularly brilliant, as we all know in the family. You moved out to Auntie Jill at the age of 17. So could you tell everybody what it was like getting that huge release of energy from after tendering resignation from the Jehovah's Witness religion to 
leaving Kent, going to Greater London, where Auntie Jill lived at the time before she subsequently moved down to Kent. Could you tell everybody what that was like when you moved out at the age of 17? Yeah, when I look back, you know, now having my own children, I can see how young 17 is. <laughs> um, but um, all my siblings really left home at 16, 17 to get away from the religion. Um, and so it was really freeing. You know, it was, you know, it was very kind of my auntie to, um, so that's my mother's sister. And so all of us siblings ended up leaving home and moving in with her. Um, and then they'd find their own way and move out. And so she had this sort of rotation of us children um, moving in with her. And um, yeah, it's like being able to do things for the first time was, was incredible. Um, it was very shortly after that, well, just a, a couple of years later that I met you. I mean, because you met, you and dad met in 1997, because you left home in 1995. Yeah, yeah. I left home, had a, two years in London. That's um, right. Yeah, and um, which was like, obviously an amazing place to be when you'd been, when you'd grown up in Seaside Kent, um, Hope's Witness. Um, and then I decided to actually move back I kept because I, I didn't think I would concentrate very well in London doing them. So I actually moved back to, to the Margate area to do my A levels. Yeah. So yes, it's a very interesting story we can showcase here in this uh, live here or the podcast. Brooke, going at first, Jehovah's Witness, first seventeen years of your life, going to Jamaica at one point at the age of sixteen. A year later, moving over to Greater London for two years, going back to Kent, you met Dad, did your A-levels. Obviously, that's a very interesting story to share, and obviously it's going to interest a lot of people. We've well, got over, we've got about 150 people who've already listened to this. What? Really? <laughs> yes, that's that many crazy. people are interesting. So what, what I should also say was as, about the religion is that you're not encouraged to get an education, which is something that really angers me. Oh, it, it, it frustrates me deeply. Yeah, well, one of the things that they encourage is that you become a full-time preacher of the religion, and that that's called a pioneer. They do not encourage any type of formal education. Um, where I lived in Kent, it was the grammar school system. So if you um, passed your 11 plus at 11, uh, you went on to a grammar school. If you didn't, you went to a comprehensive school. Now, those that went to grammar school sort of looked down upon a bit because they were maybe a bit too ambitious or academic. Um, it really was not encouraged to do A-levels or go to university because your purpose in life should be to preach the religion. Um, so it, so leaving home also gave me the opportunity to get an education um, because it would not have been allowed by my family, which is, I think, such a crying shame. So, um, and... I think probably a lot of people from my generation are now really regretting the fact that they didn't have the opportunity to get an education because they are, um, you know, probably doing the same sort of job they did when they were 17. Yeah, no, it's just, it's, yes, we were talking about this a few short months ago, just how res the, another restrictive part of the Jehovah's Witness religion is you're not expected to go in any form of higher education like that, you know, of university, doing your A-levels, that sort of thing. I mean, that's just wrong. You'd think you'd think a, a line should be drawn under that sort of restrictive thing. It's like a punishment in one way or another, don't you think? Well, it certainly will be as people get older and they... Not, not, I'm not saying everyone should go to university. It's not right. No, 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 no. We're not saying that about everybody, you know. You have the option, you should have the choice. And, and yeah. if it's want to go down, then you should be able to do it with without someone telling you not to. Or without trouble. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's just, yes, you really think it's almost like an inequality breach one way or another, or an inequality breach of uh, of right and all that. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it is, for sure. It's best that people follow their right of passage, irrespectively speaking of what religion they have or not, whether they're non-religious or religious. They should just follow their natural instinct of right of passage that's yeah. the best way forward in life i agree you know and obviously 
So it's, yes, that is really, it's always going to interest a lot of people for years and years to come, especially because I remember I was about, what, 13, 14 at the time, something like that. And you showed myself and my brother, we all watched this Jehovah's Witness documentary together and we showed just the real, real effect it can have, especially when you're growing up within the religion. I mean, you know, just, it's yeah. always some... Lots of suicides, lots of people um, who, I mean, there's a whole new thing about people who were actually abused during, or like sexually abused during a religion. Thankfully, that didn't happen to me or anyone I knew, but um, there's a whole um, very dark side to it. Um, and um, yeah, thank goodness I got out and didn't bring my own children up in it. No, I think it's... Uh... I think it's really the best, it's best that you didn't bring myself or my brother into religion. I don't think dad would have taken too well to the Jehovah's Witness religion either. Just to say, you know, because because uh, he, he never had to experience any of the Jehovah's Witness upbringing, you know. So yeah. I think it's very good that you didn't bring us as a family into the religion, and nor did all the other members of the family. Mm. And also you know you know and just because you know and the one thing that that i've seen in yours and, and dad's relationship was uh no matter what you are race wise or religion wise it shouldn't prevent you from making a family so i think that's a good showcase point you also proved in all your life that no matter what your race is no matter what your religion is uh you should just uh go with the relationship you want to have best to have a variety of a relationship you know depend no matter what your background is so mm. you and dad proved that no matter what the relationship it is mm. uh no matter no matter what your race or ba ethnic background is and all that sorry i should have worded this more correctly uh it shouldn't stop you pursuing a relationship or pursuing your instincts or anything you know so you proved a good point and all that yeah we obviously did get divorced, but... <laughs> yeah, sadly. But you're still in good touch, at least, to say the very good yeah, point. They were good friends. Oh, yes, no. Uneven terms, which is the fortunate thing, because if it wasn't, that would have been quite bad. Or oh, dreadful. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Susan asked a question. Hmm. Uh, Susan was asking how you and Dad met. So we actually met um, doing our A-levels. We were doing... Um, a level psychology together and um he was in my class and um and actually the the actual story he was in my class and i'd noticed him um and then i had managed to get hold of some cigarettes from the back when everybody smoked back in the 90s and um they were from the one of the boats i think someone had brought some duty-free cigarettes back and i was selling them to make a bit of extra money and um and i wasn't very successful at it because i'd never done it before and um he said you want me to sell these for you and so he took them off and sold them for me and the friend i was with at the time said you're never going to see that money when he took the cigarettes away and um but i knew that i would and he went and sold them and he gave me the money and so <laughs> yeah so that's how i met him yeah it's a very good I was 19. And he was 20, because there's one year between the two of you. Yes. Oh, and uh, yes, John, I remember you saying, John, if you didn't know, Mum, his uh, his mother-in-law was a Jehovah's Witness, really? much like how you were brought up as one. But fortunately, his wife was never forced into the religion. Oh, good. That was lucky for her, John. Yes, Is I mean... Or still a Jehovah's Witness, John, or... Um, his mother-in-law passed away a long oh. time ago oh, it sorry. was around about the same time his mother went both aged 86 so quite good okay wow yeah howard are you off oh howard i'm sorry i didn't acknowledge you i'm so sorry howard he was just giving a waving sign i, I would imagine you're off now howard do take care hi howard howard yes here's your shout out now I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge you because we were namely talking about my mother's early life and what it was like brought up in her from her experiences as a Jehovah's Witness to eventually leaving the religion, pursuing uh, London life and then meeting dad doing A-levels and uh, 
and many other things, you know. So it's really about and what it's like growing up as a mixed race lady. So that's what the live's really been about. And one other thing I did need to share, you had the experience, because a lot of people on here are from America as well, as well as England and other parts of the world. Yes. You've been to Florida yourself in America because our late great auntie Iris used to live there. So could you tell everybody, especially the American friends, yeah. what it was like uh, going to Florida in America, meeting auntie Iris over there? Could you tell yeah. them what it was like? It was the most exciting thing in the world was to go on our holidays to Florida. I loved it and see my auntie, lived in Orlando. And um, it was just always just, it was just so different to Ken. <laughs> and so we would go and see all the, the major theme parks and drive around and it was so hot. Um, I, I remember um, opening the front door of a house was like opening the door of an oven, like in the summer, the, the heat would hit you like the oven heat hits you. Um, it's very different to, to Margate, <laughs> um, but I loved it. I have, I've been three times before and I haven't been back since. <coughs> New York. I love New York. Uh, my best friend lives in New York. Um, yes, Brad Taylor, that's him. That's the Your one. number one best friend is Catherine and Mike Travis. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. And, um, and uh, I intend to go to New York. I work for an American company. And um, so I, I speak to American people all the time, all day, every day. Yes, that is true. Just to say, oh, and uh, Yes, Ellie was saying, I hope your mum being open and honest about her life's challenges and decisions has have inspired others who feel tied into a religion that you can get out of if you have courage. You make a point, Ellie. That's a very good point you've made. Great point. Yeah, that you if you if it doesn't feel right to you, if it doesn't feel right in your guts, then just walk away because nothing yeah. happened to you. Well, saying that one of the ways that Jehovah's Witnesses keep people in is because they will um, they will stop talking to you. Your family will will shun you, um, which is very obviously heartbreaking for a lot of people. And so that holds a lot of people in. But what I'll say to anyone who might be listening who is in that situation, um, they, they call it physically in, mentally out. Physically, they're in a religion. Mentally, they're out. They know it's bullshit. Um, but um, and the fear of leaving is, is about their lo losing their family because they will. Um, but um, I would say for your own mental health, if, if you've got an infrastructure around you of good friends, um, you will be better off leaving because being in a religion like that is is not good for you long term. That's so true. Yes. We've got Ginger from Texas on here. Hi, Ginger. Yes. Ginger may possibly be down in the United Kingdom this summer, but oh. we don't know for sure as of yet. But she's awesome. taken a vested interest in Brighton and Worthing. Awesome. She's... Yeah. We'll go for lunch. Yeah, we'll do it, Ginger. We'll do it. And yes, and one person I'd definitely introduce you, Ginger, to is David. David Scott, my best friend, because he'd like you too. I still haven't met David. Oh, point. yeah. Oh, gosh, yes, you haven't yet. Uh, yes, and uh, so very interesting experience about, uh, about Florida. It's almost like going to Las Vegas, because that's another hot climate in the United States of America. You know, once you walk out of a cool building or cool transport, walk out, it's like oven heat hitting you right in the body and the face. Yeah. You know, it, because... Yeah, it's literally like because it's really humid as well so it's like yeah i mean i remember italy was very hot and humid in the summertime because i've been in the summer many times and you've been to italy a very about 20 odd years ago you went when my brother and i were little tiny tots yeah I, well i was in italy a couple of years ago as well but not with you um, no 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 it was you and catherine at that point mm. yeah Oh, uh, Mary was saying she's happy she enjoyed Florida. I never knew you lived in Florida for six months. I oh. do know now that you are North Carolina, but you lived in Central America almost two years. Almost kissed the ground when you returned to the United States. That's quite <laughs> a fantastic but funny story, Mary, but very interesting too. 
So it's interesting as my mother's experiences when she was in Florida a, a great few times and all that. It is so hot. It's yeah. So, I don't think I could do it um, full time. No, even though we feel the cold, as a lot of us do, that sort of heat in Florida, it was just very, very greatly too much, wasn't it? Would you like to go to Florida, Foxy? <sighs> depends on what the temperature is, Mum. It really depends on whatever the hell the temperature is, I mean. Excuse my language, but fuck me, the humidity can sometimes be too much. <laughs> Um, yeah, I spoke to someone in Florida the other day with work and it was 101 and humid. Fahrenheit. It's Fahrenheit is how they always measure it in America. We do degrees. It's been 50 degrees over in the United Arab Emirates, as Sapper was saying, because Sapper's in Dubai, United oh. Arab Emirates. Yeah. I mean, bloody oh. health. Very much for your um, help the other day. I'd like to say thank you. I wasn't successful in doing it, but I appreciate you looking out for me. Yes, yes. No, Sapper was worried just then. I think he's also XRB too, like that of Graham, Trevor, and Hutch, because Hutch was on here. He's XRMI. I did tell you his story, didn't I? Did five years in the army, 1998 to 2003. You know, and what an experience he had, and saw many people break in basic training and all that, you know. Yeah, wow. That must be such an experience. I have ultimate respect for anyone that can do that. Incredible. But, uh, well, okay, next thing. So, a good story on America, and also because you've been to the, uh, New York City, how would you describe the experiences of New York City? Because we've got Susan over in New York City. Oh, wow. Yes. New York is like one of the most amazing cities I've ever been to. It's amazing. <laughs> it, it, it's like when you see a film and there's um, and you, the film in New York, it's actually like being in a film. But the yellow yeah. and the people shouting in the street. And it, I just loved it. I absolutely love New York. <laughs> yes. You know, it's always like the movies, you know, in America, when one goes on holiday, they just go somewhere and they just check into the motel like they do in the movies. It's almost like that sort of story, one way or another. Yeah. Uh, Susan was just saying, you look like Sage the singer. Oh, I don't know who that is. <laughs> so uh, but, uh, I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I'll have a look. Thanks. Susan, uh, we don't even know, Said. Ben, Sade, oh, thanks, yeah. Thank you. Well, that's a massive compliment, thank you. Was it? So. I can't read the, my eyes are too bad to read the. Yeah, the contact lenses, unfortunately. <laughs> the effect of having contact lenses, it just affects what you can read and all that. Mm. Yes, we are in uh, different rooms in the same house, Trevor, doing the live, yes. <laughs> well, that was, um, Ellie had the same sort of experience you had when she went to New York City first time. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, isn't it, Ellie? It just feels unreal. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, what, what next? Uh, I sadly did know that, Graham. Well, Graham, to tell you something, my mother, she's fine for reading, but uh, but I it's did. distance and but it's distance she cannot see. So my mother is the very opposite to you. She can read things with her glasses and contacts out, but she needs the contacts or glasses to see distance and everything. So she's completely I the opposite to you. Yeah, I've got great. I've got contact. I'm very short sighted. I wear contact lenses. The reason I can't see the captions is because I'm on my phone right now. So um, it's just tiny. I don't know whether if I turn my screen sideways, whether you'll still be able to see me. Um, oh, has that worked? Yeah. Be able to it looks that? fine. Yeah. Okay. But it's still, it's still a bit small on my phone, so I can't really see what people are writing. So I'm relying on Foxy to read it out to me. That's all right. <laughs> Carla, I did see your question. Tell you something, Carla. Everybody on my mother's side of the family is no taller than five foot six. I'm, to tell I'm, you something. And actually, I know you're obsessed with me being five foot six. I've always been five foot seven and a half. I think maybe that's I've such, a bit. 
uh, I can tell you what I was when I was when I was measured my mother's height it came as five foot six the same as Uncle Mark, Uncle Robin and Auntie Debbie but the remaining three are all under five foot six so it goes from five foot four to five foot six on my mother's side the family I, Carla. A family how can I be taller than someone if I'm the same height as them? I actually have seen that uh, I actually have seen you're know, the same height as a few. I have seen this with my own eyes. Oh, yeah. to tell you all things. I have always been five, seven and a half. So that's, I'm going to stick with that. Every five, I have seen many five foot seven people I've seen are visibly taller than you. Certainly with the flat foot where you've got, I've seen every five, seven individual visibly taller to tell you all things. Here, but I'm definitely a comfort shoe wearer I, I'm, I, I wear heels very occasionally because they're so uncomfortable yeah I did know that yes you're nearly half a foot um, shorter than that of my mother because my mother's shorter than that of my height and my brother's height you know and you're also shorter than that of Trevor and Graham because because um because Trevor's five nine taller than that of my height but in his head he's six foot <laughs> and Graham's personality Trevor that's what I always say some people <laughs> just seem taller than they are they've got a tall personality yes and I think you've always had quite a tall personality too because you always said as you claimed in the five seven range well <laughs> and if whereas whereas every person I've met just to say every five foot seven individual I've met was visibly taller even though you've got that personality for it I don't know where this obsession with heights has come from, Foxy, but you are yeah. truly obsessed with people's heights. Well, it was just because every time you mentioned it to me and then I was and I was measured at your height, I was like, what? I knew something was a bit wrong. <laughs> I'm telling this from experience. <laughs> We've got Penny from Wisconsin in here. Oh, Penny's saying that you're beautiful. Oh, Penny, I'm sure you're beautiful too. I wish I could see your lovely face. Thank you. Penny is uh, is in Wisconsin in the United States. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Penny. Just to say. That's very nice of you. Actually, tell you something, Jamba, you're the same height as my mother's best friend. <laughs> well, Jamba's five foot ten and Catherine's exactly that height. But her husband, on the other hand, he's a tiring six foot six, a foot taller than that of mum and all her brothers and sisters. And her, all her children are six foot or, or taller, to tell you off something. That I much more could be said. Ice cream, Foxy. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> you can say a quick hi. No, um, he doesn't want to. Never mind. Oh. We've got Avis in Australia here. Hello to Avis. Avis. Avis is saying some nice things about you. You're watching Tennis from the France and saying a big hello to you. Hi, Avis. Lovely to meet you. She's Australian. Oh, cool. One of We've my got... best friends is Australian as well. Uh, Kandra from up north is saying hello. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. And Joy is just saying you are an inspiration to all of us. Oh, what, me or you? Uh, me, uh, you. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you. That's like really lovely thing to say. I have no idea why. I'm actually incredibly tired today. I've had a very busy couple of days and I've just driven home, a long journey home. So please bear with me because I am actually really exhausted. But it's very... Yeah. Lovely to meet you all. It was lovely to see um, everyone. When when was I on the live the other day, Foxy? I can't remember. If I was it? It was when the was Sunday. The it was when Michelle was on. Yeah, that was. It was just really lovely. To see, <laughs> to see Foxy's got around him. I'm like super grateful to all of you for, uh, for everything. You're oh. amazing, and I hear all about you all the time. He yeah. talks about you all all the time. Oh, I certainly do. I mean, I couldn't be more. I couldn't be more fortunate to have those friends. Ah, oh, we got Susan in New New Mexico, the United States, over here. Oh, hi, Susan. 
This is Susan Elkin and we've got Susan Reich. So, and they're both American, by the way. That's Susan Reich's New York, where Brad Taylor is. And Susan Elkin is uh, New Mexico. Awesome. Oh, and Susan is just saying that you're beautiful. Sorry, I'm like, Susan, it's not a problem. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem if you're late, it's completely fine. We've got a, a bit of time because we're going to be doing about an hour. We've just gone over 50 minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, just to say. So, uh, oh, uh, before we get to the next question, Wifey Marine is saying she loved the picture of us from the Mother's Day post I did. It's a really sweet picture, actually. Yeah, that's really, thank you. I, it was... I I think, Foxy, I think you should post some pictures of, uh, of us when you were little. I think that Yes, I'll probably do that one day. I'll probably do that in the run-up to my birthday, because my birthday is just three short days after yours. It is, yeah. If, for those of you that follow Foxy, he had the most beautiful ringlets when he was a little boy. He had long hair and he had these long, big ringlets. <laughs> And it was beautiful. So we've got to find a picture of, of Foxy's ringlets for you all to see. Uh, thank you, Shirley, for the Super Thanks donation. Thank you. Uh, nice of you. Well. What are you going to buy me then, Foxy? Sorry. <laughs> no, the payment, it only comes out monthly within the YouTube. And it depends what your threshold is. It was a joke. <laughs> Yes, but uh, my hair isn't as curly now as I got older. It's sort of straightened out eventually. You had the most beautiful hair. Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, what was I going to say for the next thing? Uh, so one last thing on in coverage of Jehovah's Witness religion. What's, what's your message to all... Uh, children currently undergoing uh in the who all children in the jehovah's witness religion and uh and, and the effect it can have on them and all that what's your message to all those struggling through such a restrictive religion like jehovah's witness in childhood currently as of now do say your piece okay um well it, i mean it's it's a difficult one because some people might love it you know so if you're happy in it like my mother is then you know knock yourself out if you're unhappy then start making plans to leave and it might not you might not be able to do it straight away um, it's not easy but um but there um there are ways of doing it and um and you'll probably find you have a lot more support around you than you think and the world as it's called in the chovis witnesses which is anyone that's not a Jehovah's Witness, the, the people in the world that aren't Jehovah's Witnesses are known as the world, um, is not a terrible place. Um, it, it's not um, an inherently dangerous place. Um, yeah, no, no, it's not inherently dangerous, I know. Terrible things that happen, there are dangerous things that happen, but it, but um, as a child in the Jehovah's Witnesses, you're made to believe that that is just happening constantly, all the time, everywhere, unless you're a Jehovah's Witness, and that is just not true. So, um, so don't be fearful of leaving, um, and just just get, have some good friends that you can trust. Okay, that's a good thing. And uh, another question regarding people who, certainly in your ethnic uh, background of mi of you know mixed background or partially black. I can't read it. Can you read it out to me? Uh, no, I'd, it's a question I have. It's not a red one. Sorry, I'm, uh, I didn't hear that. What's your message to those of your, uh, in your ethnic background, what's your message to them? People in your ethnic background who are experiencing racism and things, what's, what's your message to them and how they can try and get through life, those struggling with racism in your ethnic background? Well, so you're talking specifically about people that are mixed race? Mixed race, black, right. any black ethnic minority. Um, those who, who, who suffer chronically from racism still. Yeah, I, well, I think, you know, anyone with any degree of intelligence will realise that um, any, um, there, there is no basis to 
someone being racist to you. There's no, it doesn't actually make sense from a, a logical perspective. As we're as a, <coughs> a biologist, I I can see that you know we are all the same. We may have different kind of skin, but there is there's yeah. no inherent difference between. No, oh, yeah. Um, anybody. So just keep that in mind, and no one is better than you just because. Oh yeah. And colour skin. Um, and it, it might be very difficult if you have a relentless um, racism, which I know some people do experience. Um, if I was you, if you're living in that kind of environment, I would move somewhere where that doesn't happen. <laughs> Just get yourself out of that situation. Um, but I know a lot of people have developed a really thick skin to it. Um, and um, but just just keep remembering that you're no different than anyone else. Yes, that's a very that's, good. Don't react and retaliate because because there is actually mm. no point. Yeah, that's a very good philosophical point to share. Very very well shared and everything. Uh, Susan, my mother, she's got a biology degree and she's also got a PA degree. So do tell Susan about your biology and PA degree and what it can entail and all that. Um, yeah, so I, I studied biology. I, I was actually pregnant with Foxy at university. <laughs> yes. So Foxy went to lots of um, lectures. Um, oh, but I didn't even hear about them because you were pregnant with me. <laughs> you were there. Um, uh, so I've always been fascinated with biology. Um, and then I um, did my master's and but then I studied to um, become a functional medicine practitioner, which is what I do now. So it's um, it's that root cause medicine. Yeah. Ah, we've got Harriet on here. Harriet's saying uh, that you're lovely. Oh, Harriet th Blanca. Thank you. Your little brother's just going to bed. <laughs> okay, good night. Go to bed and do stay out the living room because it's live stream time. <laughs> I'm making this explicitly bluntly clear. Uh, Yes, and also Harriet is the one who's had a soft spot towards me uh, since she heard me talking about Edmund, my late grandfather, and you always had, you had the experience of meeting him because you met him before I was born, but obviously you didn't really get along with my grandmother Anne, unfortunately. No, um, but Edmund was a lovely man. He was one of the greatest grandfathers you could have ever asked for, and obviously and the effect it it had when he died it was just profound i mean we remember that we just remember that day it was don't yeah, we? It's sad. it's still sad now and um and yeah i had the pleasure of knowing him for many years he was a lovely man and it's, yeah. it's lovely that you had the experience of having a grandfather because both of your um because he was obviously your step grandfather but both of even your... though i regard him as a grandfather but yeah, uh, yeah. He, he was but, but both your biological uh, grandfathers passed away with you and eric yes i mean but my uh you know just to say i mean even though i say my late grandfather edmund even though in real life he was my my step grandfather which i had said once a long time ago before but because of looking back on the memories i always say he was my late grandfather which is obviously it's not like a fabricated thing to do but uh, it was just because of how i regarded him yes yeah, no, of course he was married to your grandmother and he, yes. he in in every other way he was your grandfather so yes okay susan had a question i'm so sorry uh so, uh, sorry I, I think i accidentally missed things and we're nearly an hour but it doesn't matter if we go slightly beyond it. Uh, my late grandfather, Edmund, or late, you could say both father-in-law or step-grandfather-in-law until my mother and my parents subsequently divorced. So you could say it either way, you know, because looking back on the memories I had of him, he was the only grandfather I knew in all of my life. Mm -hmm. Having lost my grandfather, Eric, my mother's father, at such a young age, only four and a half months old. Uh, so, uh, so yes, uh, it's always, uh, it was always good. To, uh, the memories I have of him are always going to sustain me enormously. Yeah, that's good. 
that's to say, you know, sometimes it's a bit complicated saying the whole thing in full, but uh, sometimes when it comes to real life podcasts, do say a few things. Oh, Bill, who's on here, Bill, who I met through the Ables, he never met his grandfather. Oh, yeah, sad. I, I never met any of mine either, Bill. I mean, to tell you something, because because I mean, obviously, I never take these experiences for granted because my brother and I, we always had the, ex the fortunate experiences of spending time with our grandparents. But you, you were never fortunate with meeting your grandparents because they all died before you were born. Mm -hmm. So could you uh, tell everybody what it was like, not only growing up with the restrict, obviously you said those points, but could you tell everybody what it was like never having grandparents growing up? Um, well, I suppose I, you know, didn't know what it was like to have them because I'd never had them. But um, uh, it was always a bit weird when all my friends were seeing their grandparents, and I've never had grandparents. They they all died well before I was born. Um, yes, some of them died in the nineteen forties, I think. No, uh, in my father's. John, no. Yeah, no. 50s. It was. Uh... Grandmother, great grandmother Dorothy died when Nanny Margaret was 17 years of age. That would have been in the 50s. Yeah, but what about my father's parents? I think it was around about the 1950s, 1960s, something like that, I'd imagine. Sometime. I think it was, yeah, so my grandmother died before my father came to Jamaica. And I think oh, died. so it would have been the 50s. It was maybe the 50s, yeah, or so, 40s. My no, it would have been the 50s for Grandad Eric if it was a few short years before 59. But uh, it was, but great grandfather, our great grand, well, my great grandfather, Ronald, that is uh, Nanny Margaret's father, he died uh, when Uncle Mark was a little baby, 1971, only age 76. So he did, in a way, better than Edmund, who was only what, a mere 73, on the other hand, but could have passed for being a lot older. You know, so uh, it was just so sad you were never fortunate to have grandparents. I mean, even if he were alive as a child, he would have been very elderly. Yeah. Mm. You know, so, uh, yes. Genetic traits have a impact as I have an inherited liver condition. Yes, you have an inherited liver condition. Poor, poor you, Bill. I was talking to my mother about it and she was like, oh, we're sorry. But yeah, it's a good point. Good point to say. I mean, you know. Yeah, sorry to hear that, um, Bill. Oh, gosh, your son's 21. Gosh, my brother's going to be 22 this year and I'll be 23. So, so, gosh, I would have thought your son would be older than me. I honestly thought you'd be quite old, yeah, they felt interesting. <laughs> but he never knew any of his grandparents. Oh, Ellie. Oh. Ellie, I'm so sorry hearing of this. Sorry that your son never met any of his grandparents. I mean, because my mother never knew uh, any of her grandparents, as she was so saying. Yeah, well, we've so gone over... Been... We've gone over an hour now, so we're going to wrap this up fairly shortly. Okay. But yes, what did you need to say? I was just going to say thank you for having me on your live stream. Um, mm. I am so exhausted. I'm going to collapse into bed. <laughs> but um, it's really lovely to meet everybody. And thank you so much yeah. for being so welcoming. I yeah. really appreciate oh, it. Gosh, Rena, you're certainly taller than that of myself and my mother. Gosh. I mean, well, I know people who are taller than six foot because my friend Mark, who's the hairdresser, who you've had the fortunate experience of meeting many times, he's six foot two, so he's taller than you, Rena. But my friend Tommy Gardiner is six foot three, so, and obviously we've got Mike and Alfie who are six foot six, so I know a few people taller than you, but gosh, that is quite one height. Well, if you're me and my mother, we'd just be looking up talking to you, wouldn't we? No offence, but no offence to you in all due respect. That's all. You know, but it's just given our five foot six and five foot eight inch heights, anyone that's six foot or taller, we're just looking up talking to them. Uh, Harriet saying it was lovely seeing you, just to say. Harriet. Hmm. 
and uh, Ellie saying thank you and uh, wifey Marine is saying thank you and it's been enjoy an enjoyable hour as she so said thank you Bill thank you that's very oh, John sorry thank you John that's very nice of you to have said that and John I did keep your word following the Mother's Day post when you said just enjoy your mother every moment she's still alive I appreciate and enjoyed the moment every moment she's alive especially after the ill health ordeal she had back in December and what did you want to say to everybody who stood in your support when you were dreadfully ill shortly before Michelle got dreadfully ill back in December of 2023 did you need to say anything because everybody rallied in support when you were ill oh, they were sorry. hoping you got Sorry, Foxy, I lost I lost connection for a second. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, Thanks sorry. Everyone for being so kind with me. What was what was the illness? Well, had, you were. Uh, it was one some sort of winter illness you had, and you were very dreadfully ill with it. Everybody rallied in support when you were that ill. It That's was really just. Funny. Thank you. It was just before Michelle got very ill with the chest infection bout. I was telling you about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I kept on getting, I had flu, didn't I? And then COVID. And yeah. I, yeah. Mm. And then you lost quite a bit of weight and all that. Mm. Well, Ria, it's certainly a pleasure. And, uh, and Ria is on the Isle of Wight, by the way. Oh, if lovely. We're, Hi, if we're over on the Isle of Wight, Ria, I'll take mum, mum down with me and we'll have a nice meal with you, won't we? Mm. And... Uh, Teddy's mother in Wales, that's the owner of the Maine Coon cat I was talking to you about, because our <laughs> Daphne's Maine Coon. Uh, thank you, thank you. If we're over in Wales in the future, we'd love to give your Teddy a visit. Mm. Thank you, Lils. Thank you. That was very nice of you to have, uh, to have said that. Thank you. That was very nice of you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, lovely Caroline. Thanks, Caroline. And thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, sir, but even His Majesty the King, who was on the live, when he first learned of my mother's illness, he was dead concerned. Michelle was concerned too. And she and this is what she said. She said, I trust your mother's recovering well when she had the dreadful chest infection. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I eventually got over it. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yes. Okay, right, it's time to finish now. Thanks, Mum, for being on the live. Thank you for having me, Foxy. Thank you, it's been a pleasure, thank you. Well, we did talk about doing this and we did it. So, yes. So yes. thank you everybody for viewing the, uh, the live stream. Mrs. Murphy, it's certainly a pleasure. It's certainly a pleasure. This is Mrs. Murphy up in Scotland, who I've mentioned to you hi, before. Murphy, hi. Thanks everyone, yes. so nice to meet you. Thank you. Yes. Right. Bye. Time to finish. Bye-bye all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.